Play to Potential podcast. Lovely. Let's get started. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for spending the time and uh, joining this uh, second edition of the P2P Fireside. Uh, really excited to present this conversation to you. Uh, this conversation is titled Making Executive Search Work for You. Very often we have uh, a good sense of how executive search works when we want to uh, search for talent as a client. But very often if you're an individual at Crossroads, you're always wondering, you know, what's the best way in which I could engage with search consultants so that I could land the job of my dreams. So really excited to be presenting this conversation with Vic, who's a dear friend and somebody I've known for close to a decade now. Before I invite uh, Vivek to the webinar, uh, a few uh, snippets about Vivek, right? Uh, Vivek is currently a partner at Egon Zender and he leads the CEO succession practice in India. He also leads the consumer and consumer tech practice uh, out of Bangalore. Um, He's also a certified coach, uh, and I must share a personal anecdote here. Uh, I left Egon Zender about seven years back, and as I was sort of evaluating choices in terms of should I build a team or should I do stuff on my own, I remember Vivek uh, really looking me in the eye and saying, Deepak, you seem to have a little bit of an artisanal mindset, and I think you should stay true to that. And I think sometimes when you're walking the journey on your own, uh, it's quite lonely and you uh, you don't see yourself uh, very clearly, but uh, sort of the pithy way in which uh, Vivek uh, gave me that feedback in a, in a very caring way, I think uh, was uh, tremendously clarifying when I was sort of muddling through a few choices. So uh, Vivek is a certified coach as well. Um, before Egon Zender, he was at McKinsey. Uh, he was an associate partner uh, when he left Egon, uh, when he left McKinsey to join Egon Zender. Not only that, he was uh, actually part of the a team that led the inception of the McKinsey Leadership Institute. And before joining McKinsey, uh, Vivek has spent some time in the education sector, both as a principal of a school and as a, as a, one of the early members of an education startup, you know, several years before education was as hot as what it is today. Uh, from an education perspective, he's a, he has an MBA from I am Lucknow, where he was awarded the All-Rounders All -rounders Gold Medal. Uh, subsequently, after his stint in education, he went to Harvard, where he uh, did a master's in policy. And currently, uh, he continues to be engaged with the world of education as a board member at uh, Korea University. So all in all, uh, fascinating journey, uh, great experiences, a lovely human being, last but not the least. So really excited to be presenting this conversation with Vivek. So without further ado, let me bring Vivek into the room. Hey, Vivek, good evening. Good evening. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for making the time on a Friday evening. No, it's my pleasure. My um, son told me that nobody's going to be attending the first day of IPL is today. <laughs> I have to see her and see some others here. Yeah. No, true test of uh, personal brand, as we were discussing offline. Uh, no, thank you. Really I know we've had conversations one-on-one uh, -on -one over the years, but really uh, looking forward to engaging in this format. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Lovely. Vivek, before uh, we dive into your current hat as an Egon and uh, consultant, uh, I'd love to know a little bit about your journey, specifically some of the key transitions, right? Uh, you know, uh, MBA from I'm Lucknow, to the world of education is not an obvious choice, especially, you know, uh, a decade and a half back. So talk to us a little bit about some of these key transitions where, you know, which took you from IIM to education, to Harvard, to McKinsey, to Egon Zender. Yeah. Thanks, Deepak. So, you know, after Lucknow, I joined TAS, mm. which was beautiful because as anyone who knows TAS knows, they give you a fabulous first 15 month experience working across companies. But my personal interest has always been in people, what makes them tick, the idea of potential. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they started in boarding school when I used to teach children of the gardeners, the helpers at the, at the campus. I used mm -hmm. to teach them three days a week. So from there, started a lifelong interest in education, people, development and growth. 
So I moved to education to this company that made me run a school. And then at some point I was running a few schools. It was quite embarrassing because I was 25. I'd left school seven years ago. And uh, the people who reported to me were principals of school who were well in their 50s. So, I mean, that I learned a lot and I still feel that was the most um, valuable experience in my life. I also met my wife there, which was um, probably the biggest takeaway from those uh, 15 months. I then went to Harvard, which, which taught me a lot. I think most of all, it gave me the confidence that I can play on a much bigger stage. And, um, you know, the decision to join McKinsey was a decision actually to follow education. So McKinsey had done lots and lots of work in education around the world. And I felt that they would be a great way to go deeper in education. So I joined McKinsey India, discovered they do no education work at all, um, but I ended up doing regular strategy consulting work. Um, you know, and in, in the last two or three years, I got exposed to leadership development. One of the things a colleague of mine and I said to ourselves is, if we want to do this work, we should apply it on ourselves. So we would put ourselves to three or four weeks of training every year and through a lot of you know, introspection and thinking about what I want to do with my life, I decided that working with people more extensively is what I want to do. I found Egon Zender and uh, it's now my 10th year here. So that's my story. Lovely, lovely. And if I may go back to some one of those transition points, right, to when you say you were in the education uh profession as a, as a teacher, as a principal, and then as a member of a startup. Uh, why Harvard? Can you talk a little bit about what drove that choice? Sure. So, um, you know, I felt that a bit like medicine, right? Mm. Um, where you take the Hippocrates oath and you say, I'll do no harm, right? I feel like education is so critical to the development of human beings into adults. And I wanted to do no harm. And I felt that if I learn something at an institution renowned for education, not just the degrees it provides, but the work it does in their education school, hopefully that's a good start towards doing no harm if I spend my time in education subsequently. Well put, well put. And let's let's cut to the present, uh, Vivek. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the why, right? Now uh, you spoke about sort of uh, doubling down on the people side of things. Uh, why do you do what you do? Yeah. Um, I think, Deepak, that, you know, if you think about great leaders that have transformed society or organizations, change has always started at the top, right? Often the, a new leader taking over, you know, depending on your persuasion, you might argue, you know, uh, Mr. Modi taking over has led the country a certain way. You might argue that uh, people who've taken over as CEOs, what Dara has done with Uber, for example, is a very visible example. So I think that if you bring great leaders to organizations, the ripple effects of that can spread around not just that organization, but the families of people who work in that organization, and then the impact the organization has on society. So I felt that this work allows me to influence in a small way, you know, who gets to be in that role. And uh, that's one big motivation for me. And the other motivation is, you know, on this red line of helping people do better and potential, which started from when I was in school. Um, over the last 10 years, I've had the privilege of counseling people on their careers, right? Uh, you know that, you know, over time, people develop a trust in you because you know them well over multiple meetings. And before taking big decisions, they come to you and say, should I do X or should I do Y? And I found the privilege of being in those conversations as being the biggest reward in this profession. Hmm. True. If I may, if I may reflect, uh, what I find, uh, what I found uh, fascinating about search is: a, you have a deep insight and trust with several leaders; b, you have a view of the playground, right, the world of opportunity, and when you can marry the two and sort of connect the dots and uh, be of value to the individual, uh, it can be powerful because there are several people who have a deep insight on people, but don't have a view of the playground, right? So to be able to marry the, the what's happening at the playground with the individual's uh, specific nuances is quite a, uh, that feedback is quite valuable whenever it comes. Um, moving to the, uh, let's say a little bit of the 
plumbing of how search works, Vivek. You know, one of the questions that often people try to understand is how search consultants form a view of candidates, right? There are several factors which go in, one of one of which is probably the, the interview that the candidate uh, has with the search consultant and with the client. But just if I sort of zoom out, can you talk a little bit about the various elements that form, that form part of uh, candidate judgment in the context of a role? Yeah, thank you, Deepak. I think it, um, you know, maybe the first thing to say is every role requires somebody different, right? You can't, because you're great at X, it doesn't mean you'd be really well qualified to do every job that demands X because there'll be many other pieces that demand a different skill set. So you could be more competitive for one versus, versus another. I think one, you know, what search firms do when we think of judgment in people, I think the first thing is, you know, we have the benefit of longitudinal data, right? So um, at least at our firm, we have this beautiful system called Orchestra, which you know of, which, you know, every time I speak with someone, um, you know, I put notes. We're not trying to put anything that might be confidential, but you're trying to, you know, capture your impressions. You're trying to capture data about their careers, who they are, what their aspirations are. And if you go back and look at 25 years of data on an individual, you realize you'll know a lot about a human being. And and if I may come in, that's also observations from different people. So in a way, it sort of gives you a very well-rounded perspective very often. It does. And, you know, all kinds of observations go into it. So I'll give you an example. Uh, I was once at an airport and um, the person in front of me was, you know, he had a bit of a meltdown with, with the airport attendant. And he was screaming at her and he said, do you know who I am? And then he mentioned his name and where he worked. And, you know, my first instinct was I should put this in orchestra. Mm. Because if this person's ever going to be a senior leader in an organization, I want a colleague of mine who's doing that search to look at this and say, wow, that's interesting data. They shouldn't completely take it for what it is, but they should use that as data to say, I should probe this more, you know, as I discover this individual and see if they are the best fit for this organization. Mm. So one is sort of longitudinal data. Mm. The second thing is, I feel like everything matters, right? Um, you know, I often ask my assistant um, when she's coordinating with candidates for interviews, et cetera, what she thinks of these people. Mm. Sometimes she'll give me a perspective that, you know, will be very, very valuable for me. So everything I think, I think matters. And maybe just to give a more substantive example of that. Uh, 2017, I was doing a CEO search for a large consumer durables company. And um, uh, we had a final candidate who I, who I thought was terrific for the job, absolutely right. Um, when we came to negotiating the offer, the way in which he negotiated the offer, the words he chose to use, um, the aggression that he demonstrated in the, in, in the negotiation, it gave me pause. And I remember calling the, the hiring manager who was the chairman of the company and saying, listen, I just want to share with you, this is what's happened. Mm. And let's discuss together whether this kind of approach would be consonant with the organization you're trying to build because your CEO will be a culture builder, not just a culture keeper. And we spoke about it. We decided to sleep over it for two days. Then we went back to him and said, listen, we're not making you an offer. Right? So I think everything matters. I think everything is data. I think uh, the third thing that I find really valuable is what I call sort of this idea of four levels of listening, right? So when I'm interviewing somebody, of course, you're listening to the content, what, you, what they did, their achievements, aspirations, all of that, which is really important. The second piece is, as someone talks about themselves and other people, what beliefs do they hold about who they are? More importantly, what beliefs do they hold about them, you know, other people? What beliefs do they hold about their role as a senior leader? So understanding values, beliefs, mindsets is sort of the second. They're never articulated, but they are mm. below the mm. second piece. The third piece is body language, right? Which I won't say much about. I think all of us are familiar. The fourth one, I never for the longest time, Deepak, um, I always had a sense for it, but now I pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. It's this idea of what I'm feeling in my body when I'm listening to somebody. Right. It's really important for me now. And I pay a lot of attention to that data. And, you know, I've worked with the coach for many years to get a sense of what triggers me because I don't want my stuff to come in a conversation. 
But often if I'm really curious, um, really energized in a conversation with another person, that's good data for me. Mm. That tells me how they might be with other people. Or conversely, if there's something that doesn't sit well with me, that you know makes me feel a little bit um, weird in the stomach, then I know, listen, there's something here that I need to probe further on. And through more conversations with people who know this person, I start to get a sense of the individual and then they make a decision on, you know, should I go ahead with this person or not? So as I interview people, you know, that's what I think about, which is this four levels of listening. Got it. Got it. Now, one of the things you mentioned is fascinating, right? Very often people think it's sort of a linear process. You interview, you meet the client, you get the offer and you move on. But uh, the fact that you're still part of the conversation with the client, right? Uh, and every, and you, in a way, you're also not just looking for what the candidate is doing, but who the candidate is being along yes. the way, right? And, and the various things they do in the way they interface with you, with your assistant, uh, engage with the process. And four levels of listening is quite powerful. It, 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 it is a lot of, you know, it takes, it, it takes quite a bit of effort and work and discipline and uh, deliberate practice, if I may, to, to sort of really listen at these levels. So uh, I hear you. Um, really, because it's 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 not easy to 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 operate at four levels of listening all the time. True. Any uh, maybe just staying with this for a few more uh, seconds. Any elements which takes people by surprise, uh, uh, either a part of this list or anything else you think that uh, very often people underestimate. Um, I'm trying to think of what takes people by surprise at. I think maybe a few things, right? One, mm. um, I think people underestimate the importance of preparation, mm. right? It's, it's many, many executives I know feel like because they're such capable executives, they are capable interviewees, mm. right? Or I interview people for a living. I do this all the time. I know how to give a good interview. Mm. I think people are surprised sometimes by how they show up um, because they're just not doing a good job in a conversation. So mm. I think that's something that surprises many, many people. And now I've you know, uh, decided that for every search I do, I'm going to do a mock interview with the individual. I find mm. that net practice really helps before they get out to their first IPL match. So <laughs> I, think, um, I think that's 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 one thing. The second is... Um, I think people are, the small things matter everywhere. And Mm. when you're going for a conversation, you want to impress either by telling people about who you know or what you know. Uh, And sometimes you'll, you know, you'll create little micro moments Mm -hmm. where you say something you shouldn't, you give a secret about your company Mm. or Mm. about individual. And that might be your demonstration of, I know this person or I know this company so well, or let me tell you the school thing that we are doing. But I think those, th- those things, they don't trust. Mm. That, so when you give people this feedback, I think they are often surprised by. Uh, I think the second. The third, I think is, it'll be no surprise to you, Deepak, but for some people, they don't, they see this as a, it's fine to go for interviews. And it's fine to not accept the role when it's finally offered. Mm. Um, and there are good reasons for that. Sometimes you have multiple offers. That's great. But I've always found that being open with the company, mm. with the search consultant, um, about what else is going on is really, really important. Right? Great point. Um, for example, I tell you, uh, two weeks ago, I had a situation where somebody has quit his job. And he didn't tell any of us that he had quit his job and he's interviewing for this role. And when that got discovered, the client said, listen, this is a breach of trust. He should have told us he's quit. Not that it matters. It doesn't change who he is. But the fact that he didn't bring it up for us is a breach of trust. So, you know, I would say treat this conversation like you would if you were already in the conversation, if you're already in the company, right? The level of care, the level of commitment, the level of trust that you would demonstrate if you were already in, I think you have to operate from that same, you know, mindset, even while you're interviewing. Hmm. 
great points vivek if i may come in uh, you know i go back to a search i was doing uh, we were looking for the country head of a medical devices company and the finalist candidate was uh, a senior leader living in singapore uh, the client loved the guy uh, he said okay sign the dotted line and then when it, it was about a couple of weeks before the joining date he sends me a message uh, you know my wife might have trouble with the pollution in mumbai nothing wrong with it it's a fair assessment mumbai is not the cleanest city i, I take that but it's just the the manner in which it came up uh, long story short we uh, he backed off we uh, sort of did the search again and found another good candidate and closed it but uh, in terms of back to what you said about orchestra clearly it had an impact on the on the individual's uh, reputation at least within the firm in terms of keeping his word and sort of playing it straight uh, to your point yeah and you know deepak it's it's interesting how many people know when people do these kinds of things hmm right uh, the other day i was taking a reference on somebody um from their boss who had been their boss for four or five years in a 25 year career and i said listen i want to know about this person who who worked with you 3 years ago he said you know vivek just be careful this guy shops around but he never takes the job mm. right uh, and that's become part of their brand and i can tell you that person would have lost many opportunities because they that 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 brand is now associated with them Mm. and uh, i know i didn't choose to take him forward because i didn't want that eventuality on the search mm. so it happens all the time so one's got to be careful about how one conducts themselves and going back to one of the things you mentioned vivek interviewing well um can you share some thoughts on what it takes to prepare well and uh, you know uh, do do the best you can before you show up for an interview yeah deepak i would say that interviewing well as a you know it's a skill first of all right and the thing with skills is if you want to learn how to bowl well you spend more time with the nets you'll get better at it mm. um so interviewing is about practice you've got to practice 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 you could be the best chief executive of the most significant company in the country but if you don't interview well it'll be hard for the other party to you know say listen this is my person Mm. so that's the first the second is you know there are three simple things who why and what right mm-hmm. who are you right and i find that many people when asked this question tell me about their career history i'm actually less interested in their career history i'm more interested in their values i'm more interested in their identity how do they see themselves i'm more interested in what's important to them i'm more interested in what other people would say about them you know those are the things that make them interesting to me is really important i think in an interview to be memorable mm. right uh, if you're really capable but really uninteresting people people like stories so you know when you talk about yourself expressing that through a story will just allow the conversation to come alive so i think that's one the second is why you right so given the aspiration of this organization and where we are going why you and um, again i find that lots of people will answer that question in a skills way you know mm. experiences way i've done mm. this i've done this i've done this i think answering that in a way that says listen of course i have the right experiences but let me tell you what i've already done in preparation for this conversation that tell you what i will do if i came in mm. right Uh, and that links to the what i think shifting very quickly from you know here's what i've done in the past to here are what I, here's what i want to do in the future if i were to come in will make a huge difference to how the other person sees you so i think that's that's something to consider and the third thing is you'll be surprised deepak that many people don't do the simple thing of saying i'm meeting deepak jairman tomorrow let me see where he went to school mm. but um let me see where he went to co- you know college let me see you know oh he worked at mckinsey that's interesting i have you know so and so used to work at mckinsey right so when i meet deepak it's an easy conversation to start we can make a connection mm. as you and i know i think is really important to like the people that you're going to work with mm. is it asset sort of can i spend 2 hours with this person on a flight test and many people don't make that effort and often come wanting on that engagement which is so critical in the conversation 
Mm. Lovely. And if I may go back to one of the things you said, Vivek, about making the interview memorable. Um, yeah, I do, I do think there's a class of people who are charismatic uh, in nature, in style, and it's very easy for them to to sort of create those moments. And there is another class of leaders who are really effective, who, you know, if I may use the term, who grow on you over time, right? Uh, as you spend more time. Just maybe addressing that segment uh, in specific. Any 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 commentary on what they could do to prepare uh, in, a, in a way that's authentic uh, and sort of natural and not force-fitting uh, anything on their style? So just to understand, people, you're saying if I'm not naturally charismatic? Yes. Yeah, if I'm, let's say, uh, exactly. If I'm a Sundar Pichai, not a Steve Bomber, then, you know, you know what's, what's my, uh, you know, is there anything I should try and do to, to leave those moments with you? You know, I'm conflicted, Deepak, as you, as you mm. asked the question, because uh, I think an interview situation is so, you have to be yourself. Because if you try and be somebody else, it'll just show up. Mm. So, my advice is, you know, you've been, if you've been super effective, if you've been Sudhar Pichai, right, or you've led your own company, then clearly you have a set of skills that have gotten you there. You have a personality that's gotten you there. You have an ability to relate with people that's gotten you there. So, you know, just believe in that and back yourself and don't try and be somebody you're not. It just mm. shows through. Mm. So I'm hesitant to, you know, to say anything about them doing anything differently. Understood. Fair, fair. And you're right. I think finally, as you look at the four levels of listening, you know, even if you crack level one, the cracks start showing in two, three, and four, right? If you see inconsistencies between their values and what they're saying and the, what they're projecting. So completely uh, with you on that. Uh, moving to a specific situation, right? I think uh, one of the questions, uh, one of the things that I've discovered is very often candidates do th things along the way. Uh, you already touched upon them, which uh, hurt the candidacy without them knowing uh, stuff that's in their blind spot. So, uh, would you like to share any any things that people actually don't realize or pay attention to, but actually it's in their blind spot, but actually ends up hurting their candidacy along the way? Yeah, and you know maybe then I also share one thing that they can do to solve it. Um, hmm. I think the first is I remember the very first candidate that uh, I ever had the privilege of having a client meet at Egon Zender. Um, this person came in. He had you know been a very, very senior executive, ran international for a large Indian company. And he walked into the interview and uh, he said, sir, about 15 times to the person in, in front of him. And it wasn't a respectful sir, it was an ingratiating sir. Hmm. And, um, you know, I knew in the first 10 minutes that this interview is over, right? When he said, sir, for about the third time, I said, this is, this is done. Because I think that when people interview you, they're looking for you to be a peer to them. Hmm. Don't need to be a peer in designation and hierarchy, but you need to be a peer in how intellectually honest you are, how upright you are about your views, how you look them in the eye and make your point. I think so just being peer is critical. I mm -hmm. find many even senior leaders feel like they have to, um, you know, brown nose the interview a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it just, it just doesn't go down well with anybody. People can see through it, uh, but you'll be surprised the number of people who continue to do it. So I think that's that's one one mistake that I think lots of people make. I think the second thing that you know I've seen people do very often is, particularly if you've been really successful, right, and you're going to do a job that's similar. So you're taking a lateral move. Mm -hmm. People come in feeling like they've got this, right, mm -hmm. and they don't need to make the effort. And effort shows, right. I love mm -hmm. that Avis advertisement from many many years ago saying we are number two, so we try harder, mm. right? I think that trying harder mentality, um, it shows up in a conversation. And lots of people I know who I thought were going to be the absolutely right person for this job. And I was feeling quite happy that they were actually interested in taking this job. They bombed it because they felt the job was theirs. Mm. So I think that's the, that's the second piece that a surprising number of people make the mistake of doing. Mm. Let's, uh, I'd love to, maybe I'll pause there. Uh, as we move forward, uh, I'd urge the participants to just type in any questions uh, that, that come to you that you want us to talk about. Uh, we, we'll sort of go on for another 10 odd minutes and then maybe take some, take some questions. 
back to you vivek um i want to sort of understand how uh, people at different let's say trajectories could sort of engage with the with the search consultants right uh, let's let's take the first which is people who are really doing very well already very successful you know they are the sort of the a stars um any any headline thoughts on what they can do to to sort of stay engaged uh with with search consultants whether what they can do to stay engaged the value of staying engaged the value uh, i guess very often they are the they are the ones that are in the auction right they are uh, sought after they're getting multiple calls but very often they also end up doing a bunch of things which hurts their candidacy despite them doing well so so i guess from a career management perspective i'm just saying how do you succeed in your current job and still keep the optionalities open as you sort of walk the path yeah you know i think um i i i you know if i look at data deepak let me go back and in 2021 i did this analysis in fact all of us the firm did it to ask ourselves what percentage of people who took on a job were actually looking for a job at that point hmm. right so it's what you would classically call a job seeker Mm. and then there are passive job seekers who you know would be open for the right thing but are not looking right and you'll be surprised to know that the number of job seekers um who got roles through us was 12% right so passive candidates were 8 sometimes 9 out of 10 mm. basically goes to say that if you are doing really really well mm. right, chances are the probability of you getting an even better role is higher right so mm. close yourself to the outside world mm. and keep looking for how you might add more value to yourself now mm. i think there's something to be said about longevity and mm. staying for a number of years and compounding within your organization so mm. this is not to say that you should constantly be looking to optimize in fact i think that's a recipe for not doing well but don't be closed to you know keeping you the aperture open mm. that you learn something about yourself through that process hmm what thing i'll say is if you're truly top flight there are many ways in which you could make your career richer without making a job change hmm. it could be um advising a company it could be joining a board right and these are opportunities that people don't consider as they think about you know maybe i should go and engage with a search firm hmm. they don't think of job change right hmm. um So if you're doing really well, my invitation is, don't hesitate to have that conversation, make that engagement, because you know if nothing else, it gives you the benefit of outside, right? And I and I think this value of outside is quite important. And maybe just spending a minute on it, you know, I I forget who it was, but I remember reading this idea of outside. Yes. Insight is about you know you discovering something about yourself. Outside is other people's perspective, sort of on you, and that you know it expands the Johari window. and reduces the blind spot quite considerably so sometimes um you know just speaking to somebody who understands your industry let's say yeah. i do consumer consumer products right uh, so if there were somebody who i didn't know in consumer chances are and if they were relatively senior i would know of them i would have a sense of the reputation hmm. because one of the things that i do whenever i meet somebody new is ask them saying who are the three people i should get to know uh that you think really highly of Mm-hmm. and that always is expanding my universe of interesting people that i should get to know and um, so sometimes i'll have a point of view on people uh formed by conversations which uh which will happen without even me having met them mm-hmm. so when somebody new i can add just a little bit to the you know the amount of outside they are receiving about themselves fascinating i think uh, yeah i'm also trying to remember who it was there was a lady called tasha yurik or a lady called hermenia ibara who uh, this the stuff came up in one of my podcast conversations as well uh, but it's so powerful right i think one of the things i learned if i may dwell on it, dwell on it for 30 seconds is the person goes on to say that actually the what you learn through insight self reflection and outside often are not the same kinds of things they are different things right back to your point about the johari window which is which is what makes it so rich and valuable yeah uh, let's move to the next uh uh next uh, quartile if i may right so clearly the a plus uh the world reaches out to them they are sort of the hot properties 
very often you have these uh, if i may consistent performers right not the not the sachin tendulkar but maybe the the rahul dravids you know of the various companies where you know they're doing well they're consistent steady pair of hands but may not may not necessarily be in that very top bucket but very often the question in their minds is how do i get noticed right how do i sort of break through that uh, sort of barrier of uh, uh, being seen as a good performer in my company but how do i uh, get seen as a good performer by the wider circle yeah um so i think david would take exception you calling it as <laughs> that's true um, i realized i realized <laughs> wrong wrong example but you get the point <laughs> yes, but uh, deepak just to understand that you know so there are two things right one is how do i change the perception of how i'm performing right now the performance is the performance it's hard to change the perception of it mm. in an authentic mm. way but perhaps what you're asking is even if i'm not the one who's most sought after externally yes how to improve the odds of myself being sought after exactly exactly that, okay. exactly i'm not like a in a let's say in a group of 100 i'm not on the podium but i'm sort of around the 5 6 7 mark i'm still yeah. uh, 6 out of 100 which is a which is a good place to be uh, very often the podium gets noticed but the sort of the guys next to the podium are often missed yeah and i would say deepak that you know i have great empathy for anybody who finds themselves in that position because one might feel like there's respect only for the people on the podium but i feel deepak that there's so many opportunities particularly in our country that you know if you're willing to put yourself out there reflect on what makes you different right um, because on average you might be number 7 to use your framing Hmm. but there be one thing or two things that you do better than anybody else or you do as good as the person who's number 1 so i think it starts the recognition of what that is first of all hmm. and find opportunities that can you know uh, really utilize that and you know let me give you an example uh let's say you're a consumer fmcg person you may not if you're not on the podium right just to use that example the top two fmcg companies in the country may not come after you to become the head of marketing or head of sales or whatever it is but there are so many organizations in this country of all you know of all shapes and sizes of all types that are itching for talent like you right mm. i you know i'm just reminded deepak of something that uh, malcolm gladwell said he he asked the question of himself saying should you send your child to harvard or should you send them to you know a top 20 school right mm. and the or, or or a rank 21 school let's say right and he talked about confidence mm. and he said if if you go to harvard and you're rank 451 out of 900 chances are that you will always think of yourself as not good enough mm. but if you go to college x which is rank 41 and you top there or you in the top 20 there you will come out with a certain confidence that you know the 451 guy at harvard probably doesn't have mm. right because the top 50 schools are all great schools right so my my strong suggestion to anybody who has that feeling is you know if you're in the 70th percentile don't think of yourself compared to how you define the top talent in the country think of yourself compared to so many people mm. the opportunities you've had the experiences you've had and there are amazing opportunities out there for you mm. so what really pains me is when people undersell themselves mm. right It starts with identity right and i remember you know this beautiful thing somebody said who would you be if you started seeing yourself the way you saw yourself because before the rest of the world told you who you are fascinating so that's a that's a deep question hmm i hear you and and just maybe uh, the last point on this to understand this fully more tactically in terms of let's say this next segment uh, getting in touch with search consultants what's uh, what would you recommend they do to sort of uh, get connected or engage with search consultants yeah deepak i think first of all we are really grateful to anybody who reaches out to us i think it's a you know it's a little bit like you know going to the confession box at the church right so it requires some courage to out yourself and i really mm-hmm. respect that when people reach out mm mm-hmm. i will say one thing in all humility most search consultants i know 
they are inundated with people reaching out to them right um, i think on linkedin you know i think i would get 250 300 connection requests uh, a month right mm. uh, and lots of linkedin messages and it's really hard to keep up and then there are people mm. who whatsapp you and email you mm. it's really hard to keep up to to follow and now i've come to a point where i can only reply to some but not everybody right so i think what really helps is making the effort to say you know i really want to get to deepak i know vivek i remember he was on his podcast can i ask vivek for introduction mm. right um, or i worked with person x you know who who might know somebody at the search firm let me ask them it's like picking up the phone calling your mentors and say who mm. do you know at the search firm can you call them say i'll be calling them and mm. odds of me responding will increase 10x if you call mm. me and said speak to a friend of mine i would make the time because you're suggesting i should mm. but if that same individual reached out to me on linkedin it's possible i might not even see the email great point great point it's almost like how you spoke about references right when you meet people you ask them about three people that they they respect and that sort of suddenly changes the way you see people right so finally it's about just that uh, circle of trust that that sort of goes around uh uh got it why don't we pause you vivek if that's okay um let's take a couple of questions um we have ankita who's saying uh as a search professional what are some of the things you can do to proactively overcome or manage your own biases um i think it's a great question ankita so i think there are lots of things that come to mind but maybe just to focus on the top two and that isn't true for search professionals i think it's true for all of us as human beings i think is the importance of um reflection right i think um, examining yourself in everyday life is the single most important thing one of the things that we do at egon zender is um we are invited to have our own coaches right and i've been working with somebody for the last 3 and a half years now and i find that going to confession or going to to this coach is is a great way for me to learn about myself right because it's a space in which i can be completely open i talk about things i've not done so well what's triggered me right and i think that really helps me um recognize my own biases because i will get triggered sometimes by somebody uh, more than once more than i mean of course sometimes very often but knowing when that happens and separating this these are my triggers this is how i get triggered so if i'm feeling this way chances are it's me but you know this feeling i'm feeling it doesn't usually happen to me so it must be the person that i'm actually with at the moment right or this situation so that's how i think the examined life which happens through reflection and journaling i think is a is a huge way at least for me to overcome a bias i think the second thing is what we do at the firm is we work in teams right and um sometimes i find that i'm taking a position on a person and another colleague will challenge me on it right so having somebody there to provide you that counter point is invaluable because at the end of the day you know i think of what we do in search not as complicated but as complex right um, and maybe i can spend a minute on that distinction yes right i think complicated is a domain of best practice right um, it's it's it says this requires expertise you but there's a repeatable process right you can you, if if you know the expert in the world that does this you can do it well you just follow these steps but because we are dealing with human beings emotions uh, identities right the world of senior leadership interviewing uh, engagement is complex because there are so many things that's going on within both individuals under the surface that over time you have to develop a facility to begin to understand how to navigate a certain situation so in my mind these are complex things and i never take forget for 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 granted that even after doing this for 10 years i'm doing it well um if i stay at this firm i have another 22 years to go so it's a long way deepak and the journey to work on my biases will just keep continuing hmm actually just picking up on that uh, 
Harold D'Souza asked an interesting question as well, right? Just uh, back your point about the long game. And, I, and at the surface, it looks like you're doing the same thing over time, but there's an opportunity to just, just keep chipping away at yourself, right? At the various elements of the profession. So as a search professional, what do you do to upskill yourself? You know, uh, apart from what you've learned as a coach, what are your daily habits or rituals or other practices that, uh, that help you get better and do well in what you do? Um, thanks, Deepak. I'll say two or three things, and it's probably true for every profession, but I'll try and make it personal as well. The one is um, it's constantly going to people to get advice on situations. I feel like perspectives from other people who walk the path uh, is really critical. So um, I have a dear colleague, uh, Govind Ayar, who you know very well, Deepak. He's now left the firm. Terrific guy. Even today, I will call him and say, listen, this is going on. I need your advice. Right. So I think just being able to reach out to people whose judgment you trust, I think, is, is one. The second for me is, um, you know, keep going back to teaching younger people at the firm. So I'm involved with a training program internally where every twice a year for a week, I teach people who are in the third year in the firm. And because they ask questions that challenge me, they ask questions that make me revisit what I do and how I do it. I find that at the end of that week, I often have lots of things to refine in how I'm working. Most of all, it reminds me of the gold standard of this profession, right? Mm. How to do it really well. So that's the second. The third is, I find that when we work with senior people, often the challenges they're dealing with that are coming in the way of them being successful um, are what I would call relational challenges, right? For the longest time, I thought of IQ, but now today, I think more and more of RQ, right? Which is the ability to have sustained positive relationships over time. That requires a long-term perspective to relationships. And most people will be, I mean, lots of people I know are damn good while maintaining relationships over three months, six months, two years, five years. But yeah. how do you maintain relationships over 20 years, right? I think that I find is, is remarkable because the, the, the community's conversation, which is basically your reputation, mm -hmm. develops over 30 years, right? And for most people, they will get into very, very senior roles in their mid 40s and you know, early 50s. And in the 20 years prior, the reputation that they've built will really carry them. Mm. That's the second. So because of these relation challenges, Deepak, I, for example, have been training not just as a coach, but I'm starting to train as a therapist, right? Wow. And um, because I feel like, again, to the point of doing no harm, I want to present myself as a coach. But lots of the things I deal with, even as I coach people today, are actually in the realm of therapy. So if I go to somebody and say, I want to be a therapist, they'll probably not sign up. But if I go and say, I want to be your coach, mm. they will sign up and then we can do some therapy. So fascinating. That I'm doing. And you're right. It's, it's a bit like uh, you never know when you're sort of uh, crossing the line, right? It's a very fine line uh, that you cross sometimes and you can do harm, as you rightly say, if you're not uh, equipped to have that conversation. Um, let's come back to, uh, we'll, we'll sort of maybe take some Q&A towards the end. Uh, Coming back to uh, our thread, uh, Vivek, the other thing that uh, I've often noticed people say is search consultants are very helpful when you're sort of in a way, if I may, extrapolating the dots, right? You're sort of in a certain career and you want to build on it, become more successful in a similar domain. But very often people are trying to pivot and do something else. Uh, in, in those kinds of situations, uh, what advice do you have for them in the way they engage with you for them to find a different canvas or a different playground? Yeah, it's a great question, Deepak. And I have to tell you that uh, I have great empathy for search consultants as well. Oftentimes people tell me that, you know, if I'm not looking to be the, you know, round circle in a round hole, then mm -hmm. search consultants are not very helpful, right? Mm -hmm. And I empathize with the search consultants because of, you know, the way their mind works and the things they're focused on. I'm actually not convinced that your average search consultant, mm. the exceptional ones out there who will work with you to help you clarify your thinking, but the average search consultant does not have the time, mm -hmm. does not want to make the time sometimes to have that discussion with you, mm. right? So I'm not sure they're the place to go if you want to discover or go through that discovery process. Having gone through the discovery process, right? If you want to test hypotheses, 
Mm. I think such consultants are fabulous people to do that. Right. Mm. Um, so I would just make that distinction, right? Mm. I know you advise people on transitions, right? I would urge people to seek you out or a mentor out, right? Mm. To have that discovery conversation, mm. but come and test hypotheses with such consultants. That's probably the most efficient and most valuable uh, input you will get, right? Mm. Um, from the average search consultants. And if I may uh, sort of pressure test that, right? Very often the fear could be that I might be seen as somebody without adequate conviction or direction. You know, how do you sort of reconcile that testing hypothesis versus a certain confidence that you're looking for in a candidate in terms of how they want to shape the journey? It's a great question, Lisa. And, you know, I think there's no straight answer. I think mm. all of us have a spidey sense of the human being in front of us. Mm. Um, there are people I will bear my soul to and there are people I just won't and they could be doing exactly the same job mm. right there are bosses I've had who I'll be very open with there are others I will not be as open with mm. right I think it comes down to the individual and you're feeling like listen I can hold this person's you know this person can hold you know my conversation and confidence so mm. I think it really depends on the interpersonal the space between two people very and true. your need of that space very true um, a related question in, in, this, in the context of pivoting, Vivek, is uh, sort of sabbatical, right? Uh, to do or not to do, right? This is often a million dollar question. And, and one of the things that often comes in the way of people considering a sabbatical is, uh, you know, would I, would I still be marketable uh, if I came back from that sabbatical? And as a, I must say, right, as, a, as somebody who advises people on transitions, very often I say, it's useful to build a pause, you know, whether it's a month, three months, six months, again, the duration could vary. But sometimes when you're on the treadmill, you often don't have the, the aperture is quite narrow. It's hard to have a wide aperture when you're running. And when you have the confidentiality around the role and your, sort of the limitations around who you can talk to. So what's, what's your advice to people on, on just uh, how, how they can do their soul searching while still without losing the relevance in the, in the world of uh, opportunity? So I'll say two things, Deepak, uh, and I'll make a distinction between sabbaticals and career breaks. Mm. Right? And maybe if you don't mind, I'll just spend a minute. Please, each please. I think a sabbatical is invaluable, right? I would strongly encourage it. But I define a sabbatical as taking a break to refresh, recharge, pursue a new hobby, learn something new, spend time with you know an important family member going through health situation. Those are great examples of sabbaticals, right? Mm. And I think you know, we might feel like, listen, we lose out at work, possible, but it's worth it in itself, right? So that's mm. about it. career breaks are different. Mm. I'm enjoying myself at work. I'm not sure this is the job for me. I want to quit. And I want to take three months and figure out my next job, right? Um, I'm a little bit skeptical of career breaks, right? Mm. Uh, mm. And let me, I'm skeptical. One, I feel that for a lot of, there are good reasons for a career break. You have a, you know, so let me not go to those reasons, but there are some good reasons. But I find for many people, they're not happy at their job and they decide they want to quit. And my feeling always is that, you know, wherever you go, there you are. Mm. Right? So if you're somebody who's feeling burnt out because the job is driving you too hard, it's worth asking the question, is that you or is that the job? Right? Because you might take this break, go somewhere else and find yourself in the same spot because it's a function of who you are. It's not a function of the job. Right? Mm. You might find that you can't get along with your boss. You know, the guy's very hard to work with. That's great, but you might go somewhere else and find that you're not in a very different situation. So maybe it's worth asking yourself what can I do to become better at dealing with situations like the one I'm in? Mm. versus how do I take a break to find something else? Just one last point around that, Deepak. I find that yes. particularly in this country, people are a little skeptical of career breaks. Mm. Uh, there's a certain cynicism. Uh, people second-guess motivations. They wonder if you took a break or there were other circumstances because of which you don't have a role. And um, I think you end up, lots of people could end up putting pressure on themselves and then take a suboptimal role because it's been three months now, it's been six months. Now it's been eight months and I haven't found a job. You know, let's take the next one that comes along. Mm. The final thing I'll say is I know more than one employer that they will not hesitate to squeeze you because you don't have a role, right? 
mm. uh, while you're in a company and being paid, they will give you a hike on that. But because you don't have a job, you suddenly don't have a last salary. And mm. they will say, can we get this person at a discount? I've heard that conversation many, many times. So just a few things to consider as you consider career breaks versus mm. sabbaticals. Got it. I like that distinction. Uh, sabbatical versus career break. Got it. Got it. Um, I'm mindful of time, Vivek. I know I know. there's an IPL match that started. So maybe a couple of questions from the audience and then we can wrap up coming up to the hour. Um, one of the questions from Subroto is, uh, you know, if, if you really want to shape a relationship with a search consultant as a two-way conversation, how can we as individuals think about adding value to the search professional? Yeah. Um, thank you, Subroto. I think it's not very different from how you might think of adding value to any other person, right? Um, and, you know, for example, lots of people who've been able to add value to me, I'll give you some examples. Mm -hmm. um, somebody gave me feedback on, you know, how I came across to them, mm. right? When I first called them or when I interviewed them, it's hugely valuable. I remember that person fondly, right? Um, and it doesn't have to be positive feedback. Take a risk. If you didn't like something, share it with them, right? Mm. Um, so I think that's that's one. The second piece is, hey, listen, um, Vivek, here's this outstanding uh, friend of mine. I mean, this friend of mine is an outstanding marketer. You guys should get to know each other. Mm. Right? That's a great way to add value. A third way is, you know, just simple things like you would do for anybody. I remember when you were at McKinsey, one of the things the firm encouraged us to do was to find interesting articles and send it to our clients as a way of building a relationship with them, right? I mean, the same thing applies. Any mm. human you're trying to build a relationship with, you know, how can you do the small things that make you be noticed, which add value, and over time lead to a more richer experience for the both of you? But I think the simplest, easiest one is feedback, mm. right? It takes no time. It requires some courage, not a lot, but the return on time of giving feedback is invaluable. That's wonderful. You're right. It does involve taking risk. And if I may build on the point you said about uh, suggesting good talent, I've seen the flip as well, right? Very often people forward CVs without curation, right? And very often if that becomes too often, then that uh, starts diluting uh, you know, uh, one's impression of somebody. So I think just, uh, I think the key word there is, I guess, judgment and curation and adding value uh, deliberately and not just uh, sort of uh, forwarding stuff. Yeah, and I think the, the other thing is, you know, it's really important to support the people you care about, mm. um, but also think about which connections will add the most value to them. Mm. Right. Um, there are even search firms operate in certain functions. They operate at certain levels. There are firms that focus on entry level. There are focus, firms that focus mid market. There are firms that focus on CXO talent and board. Just, you know, I think just thinking about should I introduce this person to firm X or firm Y, I think will really be valuable. I think that's the mm. other thing to keep in mind. Mm. There's a question from Paroma. And she talks about uh, where do you draw the line between authenticity and plain bragging? And if I may paraphrase that, uh, a question that I used to get asked very often is, you're trying to put your best foot forward. And very often, you're also trying to be authentic at the same time. And uh, sometimes being a little vulnerable is helpful in building trust. So how do you reconcile putting the best foot forward and being vulnerable to build trust? Yeah, you know, I think it's a great question. And you know, one of the things I do is I encourage people to, to, to not be humble and drag because that gives them a little bit of permission to, to mm. really open up because I can, I can imagine people feeling a little bit, you know, AG of overselling themselves. Mm. Um, however, I think that, you know, perhaps recognizing the moment in which to quote unquote talk about your achievements or brag as Paroma says it, um, I find that people ent enter conversations, particularly with us as search firms, in a sort of templatized way, right? Mm -hmm. um, they'll come into the conversation and within three minutes, start telling you about their achievements. Mm -hmm. But 
it's like a conversation with, a, with between any two human beings, right? You need to build a rapport. You need to build a connection. Mm. Ask if, listen, it's a good time for me to talk about my achievements. Mm. Right? And done in that way, I think it leaves the other person feeling, you know, much better than if one were to pick up the phone and, you know, here in the first, second or third minute, let me tell you about my achievements. Because mm. they're also, you know, you question ability to engage of that individual at that time. Mm. However, just to answer Paroma's questions much more directly. Um, you know, I think there is a difference between you could have towering achievements and speak about them in a way that doesn't feel like bragging, or you could have the same achievements and speak them speak about them in a way that seems like bragging. Mm. And the biggest dif- the biggest distinction between the two is how much of it is about yourself. Mm. Right back to the point of the relationship quotient, back to the point of the I versus we. Right, um, if you're talking if it comes across that you're speaking about yourself and how you were the center of the universe at that organization, uh, it will come across as bragging because chances are you won't, even if you were the CEO of the company, right? So that's something to keep in mind. Hmm. Vic, we could go on and on. Uh, maybe in the interest of time, uh, the one question I like to ask everybody who I talk to is, uh, what does the term play to potential mean to you? I think now for me, Deepak, if I think of play to potential, I just think of you and and the podcast and the <laughs> brand. You. Um, Thank you. So Thank that you. for me, play to potential means Deepak Jaraman. But um, if I think about that a little bit more, I think there are two pieces of it, right? Uh, the first is play. Mm. And um, I think in the way that you thought of it, perhaps uh, it's, it's this idea of um, of play as a verb, right? Mm. You play towards your potential. You play towards becoming a better player, better um, executive or whatever. I think there's the play as an adjective, right? Which is having fun while doing it. Because, mm. you know, I find that all of us, our primary identities, particularly the last 25 years in corporate India, our primary identity is work and everything else is a secondary identity. And I remember reading Deepak in, uh, on one of your podcasts, actually listening to this idea of work, self, family, and community. Yes, right? Stu, Stu Friedman. Yes. Stu Friedman, right? And, and I love that idea because it takes away from this notion of the primary identity being work, right? Mm. So being a little bit more playful, a little bit more broad-based, that sort of play and sort of potential is, you know, to the back to the point of reflection and outside, right? Um, even, you know, I think it's really important to understand yourself and your values and have the benefit of outside to be challenged about how big your dream for yourself can be, right? So if you're thinking about your own potential, marrying those two in my mind is is really, really important. Otherwise, I think, you know, if there are two stools you're standing on, you're standing without one leg. Mm. So think about those two and, and then developing a future frame for yourself is probably advisable. Lovely. Vic, uh, thank you so much for making the time. Really, really enjoyed and uh, lots to reflect on. Uh, thank you so much for making the time and for being present in this conversation. No, thank you for your time, Deepak, and for hosting me today. And thank you for everything you're doing to get this podcast out. I've learned a ton from, from hearing it over the years. And I'm hoping this conversation can add a little bit to it. Thank Lovely. you. Thank you, Vivek. And maybe just a quick note to the to the participants who are still there. Um, so this was the second conversation. The third conversation, just to give you a, a quick preview, is uh, with a gentleman uh, from the Indian Army, uh, Lieutenant General Ramesh Kulkarni. Uh, he's written a book about his uh, leadership challenges in Siachen uh, Glacier. Uh, uh, and, and Siachen, for people that don't know, is often considered as a third pole where even survival is hard. You know, just staying... Uh, just uh, living from day to day is hard enough. So how do you really in that harsh environment command a group of people, inspire them and uh, fight an enemy uh, under extreme odds? So very soon we'll share the details of that conversation on LinkedIn. But uh, thank you so much for uh, being with us this evening. Bye and have a great weekend. Thanks, Vivek. Thank you. Bye.